Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, so this is the Environmental Excellence, Awareness and Sustainability uh, capstone number two. Um, with us today on the call, we have uh, Gina Reedy, Cody Schlenz, and uh, I'm Tyler Tebow. We're all from Wellmark. And then um, unable to join us today was Robin Stefan. Um, but also with us, we have uh, Sarah Borzo from Metro Waste Authority, um, educational outreach or educational and outreach coordinator. Um, so Sarah, if you want to go through um, just some introductions and we'll kick off the presentation. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much for letting me join you today. Um, I am Sarah. I've been at Metro West Waste Authority for about a year and a half at this point, and I just lead all things education and outreach. So working with members of the community from school age children to people in retirement homes and everything in the middle. Um, and I just get to talk about all things sustainability. So largely that's recycling, but as you'll see in the presentation, it incorporates a lot of other things because there's a lot more to sustainability than just recycling. So I'm very excited to be with you today to talk through some of those ways that we can all collaborate together to, to make a more green and sustainable future. Awesome. Yeah, great to have you. Thank you. All right, are you ready for me to jump into my presentation? Let's do it. Okay, fantastic. So this is sharing, right? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so when we talk about going green, there's obviously so many different things that that incorporates. And so we won't be able to hit on all of those in a short time, but um, I'd love to be able to talk a little bit about who Metro Waste Authority is and then all the ways that, that we work with the community to make a greener and more sustainable future. So it's usually great to start with who Metro Waste Authority is because a lot of times there are numerous misconceptions about who we are and what we do. So we're what's called a quasi-governmental solid waste agency. Quasi-governmental just means we have a lot of government regulation and oversight, but we are not funded by tax dollars. So we are entirely self-funded. We oversee contracts between cities and their garbage, yard waste, and recycling haulers. That's another big misconception. We don't have our own fleets of vehicles who are picking anything up curbside. We just help cities manage the contracts with the haulers that they've selected to do that work. And then we work with member communities to provide opportunities for and education about safe, responsible waste management. And to be able to achieve that, we have two landfills. One is called Metro Park East, and it's close to Mitchellville. The other is Metro Park West, and it is in Perry. We have two transfer stations, and if you're not familiar with that term, a transfer station is just kind of a midway point between neighborhoods and the landfills themselves so that every vehicle isn't making the trip out to the landfill every time it gets full. So there's a midway point where they can come, tip off the waste, and then um, a much larger vehicle will take much larger quantities back and forth to the landfill um, as, as it fills up. We also have two Metro hazardous waste drop-off locations multiple recycling drop-off locations. One of my favorite things, the Environmental Learning Center and Grounds, which is near Runnels, Iowa, and it is 500 acres of restored prairie and wetland, as well as a converted farmhouse that is now a teaching classroom that has pretty much every piece of scientific equipment you could utilize to study the environment, um, which is available to all teachers in Central Iowa to use free of charge at any point and then our brand new Metro recycling facility, which we built in Grimes and started operation in November of last year. So a lot of different facilities that help us achieve that goal of educating about and providing safe, responsible waste management. It's also good when we talk about waste management that's responsible to, to acknowledge that the final destination for materials that are not recycled or diverted is the landfill. And I love to have this imagery available because it really is kind of humbling, horrifying. I don't know how to, how to really conceptualize it, but when you see that this is that end destination for those materials and that that's where it will be forever, I think it provides a really good um, motivator to be better at diverting. And we at Metro love to say, even though we do operate the largest landfill in the state, that we're working to put ourselves out of the landfill business through diversion. Um, simply also because using the landfill method and, and sending, you know, tons of material there that could have been diverted otherwise is simply not sustainable. So we love to talk about sustainability through diversion. That might be through the yard waste program, e-waste and appliance demanufacturing, or the curbside recycling program. 
So the yard waste program is available to all of our member communities, and that's just where we collect things like uh, twigs, branches, leaves, grass clippings, and then send them to a dedicated compost pad, which is equipped with top of the line equipment and is very scientifically managed so that the process is quick between converting um, freshly delivered material into that compost, and then that can be put back out into the community. Our e-waste and appliance demanufacturing programs, um, with both of those programs, we are able to take appliances and um, electronics all the way apart and almost 100% recycle each one of those items so that no part ends up in the landfill, which is very exciting. And then the curbside recycling program is what we're all most familiar with and is typically one of the biggest ways we can contribute to the sustainability of a good diversion program. It's also important to think about, especially with things like recycling, what are the regulatory differences between residences and corporations and businesses? And so in the Des Moines metro area, most of our communities have a city ordinance that requires residents to participate in the recycling program. And that doesn't mean that you know somebody is sorting through their garbage cart and figuring out if they put any recyclables in there. It just means that they are billed for recycling and they are required to participate in the program. It is not optional. Businesses and corporations, on the other hand, they do not have that ordinance that applies to them. So they have to elect to participate in recycling programs. Um, and so there's a little bit more uh, discrepancy, I would say, between groups that do and do not participate because it is not an ordinance that requires it. Regardless, though, of what the source of the recycling is, whether it's a residence or a business or corporation, the process is largely the same for what happens after that recycling leaves the curb. So in the metro area, most communities have their recycling that ends up at our brand new recycling facility, which is called the Metro Recycling Facility. So it gets collected by one of those independent haulers, and then the independent hauler brings that material to us for further processing. Once it makes it to the material recovery facility, which is the general term for any recycling location, it gets tipped off and you can see in that photo that it is definitely single stream, meaning that nobody is pre-sorting their recycling anymore. It's all piled up together. Then through a combination of machinery, equipment, technology, and people, it gets sorted. And then ultimately it ends up getting crushed into cubes called bales and then sold to a manufacturer who can turn that material into something new. Because we did just open this brand new facility, it is a really great time to be able to share um, some of that behind the scenes look at what our central Iowa MRF looks like, um, just so that you can have a sense of how state of the art cutting edge this facility is. So I would love to just show you a quick little behind the scenes sneak peek. And again, this material recovery facility is in Grimes, Iowa. Recently constructed. So it does have a large um, office and education center attached to it. And I like to start the tour here because it also will give you a sense of scale and how tall this building really is. It needs to be very tall to be able to accommodate equipment of the height that we have. So you'll get some context here for that in just a moment. Super tall. And then we just had completed this beautiful mural on the wall leading up to the active part of our education center. Here is the interactive exhibit portion of our education center, um, which is nearing completion. Once that's complete, we'll be excited to open for public tours and then hopefully be a destination for field trips. I'll pause here for just a minute. This is a great opportunity to see that the education center itself does have full windows on both sides so that you can see the entire recycling process from the inside, but then you also have the opportunity to get decked out in protective gear like hard hats, um, protective eyewear and high visibility vests and head out onto the sorting floor as well. But regardless of your ability to interact with these pieces, you can certainly see what's happening all along the way. This is called the tipping floor, so this is where all of that recycling gets dropped off. It gets picked up by a scoop loader and then it gets put into this container here, which has a rotating drum. And then this long piece is a big conveyor belt that takes us in to the sorting floor. Then this is the first 
batch of equipment that the recycling meets up with. And I'll pause here again to, um, to, to give a quick little bit of context on this. These are called large rotating augers, and we are only the second facility in the world to have these installed at this phase of the recycling process. And what's cool about this is because of the size and the speed at which they rotate, it takes all very large pieces of things like corrugated cardboard from large boxes, and it sends them on a different path right away so that humans don't even really have to involve themselves in the sorting of that material. Smaller things drop through, and then they have a different conveyor belt that they land on to continue the sorting process down the line. As those materials work through, like I mentioned, there are a lot of human um, human sorters who engage in the sorting process as well. And then there are a number of really advanced technologies that can also help minimize the amount of work humans actually have to do that kind of streamlines the process. So here is one of those technologies. I'll pause to let you know what to look for. This is called an optical sorter, and it has a combination of cameras and lasers that sense for different types of material. And if it's the material that it's looking for, it'll jump up and over this little barrier right here to go on a different path, and then other materials will just drop, drop straight down. So when I fire this up again, you should be able to see some types of plastic look like they're fish jumping out of the water, jumping over that barrier. So we have a number of different optical sorters sorting for different things, and that's just a really helpful technology. Then at the end of that process, we have these beautiful clean bales that are formed. Each of them can weigh up to uh, 2,200 pounds, and they are sized perfectly to be able to load onto uh, semi trailers, or um, at some point we're also on a rail line, so they'd also be able to be the right size to load onto train cars to be able to be transported to their next destination. So we don't do any of the processing of the material. We just do the sorting and the crushing of it into cubes so that it's ready to move on to a manufacturer who can take it through the next stage of the process. Um, that takes us then to what makes something recyclable. And really that just boils down to two main things. It needs to be able to be sorted and then it has to be sold. When I say it has to be able to be sorted, um, sometimes people will say, well, why can't I recycle a frying pan? It's aluminum and it's plastic. Both of those things are recyclable. Well, the aluminum, the, me the metal part itself is not necessarily the same type of the rest of the recyclables that we're collecting, so that's a separate issue. But the big thing with that is you can't separate the plastic handle from the metal of the rest of the container easily, so it's not sortable. Um, when it comes to being sold, we have to have a buyer who's regional and, and interested in purchasing that product. If there's no market for it, then you're not really able to accept that commodity, which also explains why different regions have different recycling rules. They have to have a buyer who is willing to purchase that material if they're going to accept it. That sorting process we just looked at, um, like I mentioned, we have these different types of technology that help sort. We do have humans, though, who are having those conversations about what kinds of things we're seeing, um, revisiting recycling rules, educating each other about what things need to be pulled from those conveyor belts, um, and just talking through all of those processes. So it's a very dynamic and human-centered process as well. And then I love to point out, this is that format for what recycling looks like. Those human sorters stand in these gaps between um, these kind of metal containers that are actually chutes that either end in other containers or on new conveyor belts. And so the person standing here knows that they're sorting for whatever the chute on the left and the right of them is. So the person here would be sorting uh, corrugated cardboard, so just regular cardboard box cardboard, or mixed paper. That's the things that they're looking for to drop down to, to move them on to the next phase. I think we'll go pretty quickly through specific guidelines because those do differ depending on where you are. But in central Iowa, um, we are looking at uh, the, the main commodities that we accept are paper, aluminum and tin, glass and plastic. But within each of those categories, of course, there are some little rules and caveats. So with paper, we can accept almost all kinds of paper, um, magazines, junk mail, toilet paper tubes, cereal boxes, newspaper, sticky notes, stickers, all of those things are recyclable. 
The things that we can't recycle are things that have a different material attached to them. So like glittery wrapping paper has a glitter layer and we can't get that removed. So glittery wrapping paper and then things that are foil covered um, are also some some things that are less desired. They are confusing to the machines. They have a hard time reading them. But then that foily material is again not separatable from the rest of the, the material. With shredded paper, we love that, but it should go into a paper bag. Otherwise, this is what it looks like when loose shredded paper comes down the line. It is like a confetti party, but it's a party you didn't want to go to. That just gets everywhere, super difficult to clean up. So we just ask that that be contained in a paper bag. Cardboard is in that same category, but I like to call that one out separately just because um, since the pandemic and actually before the pandemic as well, the rise of online shopping has led to a significant rise in cardboard, but it means that there's a lot of turnover and interest in, in receiving recycled cardboard to make the new boxes. So Iowa has a really great recycling record for cardboard. I think I just read that we're third in the nation in terms of per capita cardboard recycling. So we're doing a great job. We also try to make recycling cardboard easy as as possible. We only do collection every two weeks for recycling and we know that oftentimes cardboard takes up a lot of space in the cart and that fills up too quickly. So as I'll show in just a moment, we have a lot of different places that you can drop off cardboard midweek if your recycling cart is full. Aluminum and tin is pretty straightforward, but aluminum happens to be my favorite commodity just because it is so efficiently recycled, recyclable rather, that um, once you have recycled that can, not only is it 100% recyclable, nothing is lost in the process, but it's also so efficient that it's often back on the shelf in your same area with a new beverage in 30 to 60 days. So that is just a really, really valuable um, commodity and a great material to make sure is properly recycled. Other things like pet food cans, soup cans, food cans, or body product cans like hairspray, all of those things can be recycled. We don't need to worry about removing labels. The lids are recyclable too. Um, we just want to make sure that if it was containing food, it gets a quick rinse before it gets put in the cart. It doesn't need to be scrubbed, just a quick rinse. Even if there's some little pieces hanging on, there's a little bit of, of residue stuck to the edge, it's more environmentally friendly to just give it that rinse and let us let us move it on to the next phase where they can do a better job of cleaning it. Glass. Now this one is tricky and a lot of different places have a lot of different rules about glass, but what makes glass such a unique commodity is that it doesn't stay together. So at every phase in the process, whether you're just tossing it into your cart and it shatters or it's getting put into the recycling truck and it shatters or it's getting tipped out and it shatters, it's breaking all along the way which is not actually a bad thing. Like there's a lot of empty space inside of each of these containers. And if you want to efficiently transport them to the next area, you'd like to get rid of some of that space. So breaking is good. However, when it's going through all of these other steps along the way to get to the end destination, we lose a lot of that glass. So when it moves from the cart to the recycling truck or the truck to the ground, it is constantly losing little pieces of glass. And so they say that when you recycle glass in your mixed curbside recycling, only about 30% of it ends up actually making it to the next recycling phase. Um, and so we're losing 70% of the glass and it's not getting recycled. However, if you can take those things back to the grocery store or put them at a dedicated glass drop off location, 90 to 95 percent of that glass ends up getting recycled. So you can recycle it curbside. Just know that it is not the best option to make sure the majority of that glass gets recycled and turned into something new. And then plastic. Plastic has a really simple rule for us, but it still generates the most questions. So Metro's rule on, on plastic recycling is if it has a twist off top and is something you don't mind putting on or in your body, then you can recycle it and yogurt containers without the lids. And that might seem like an arbitrary set of rules, but the 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 motivation for those rules is that this gives us all the different types of plastics that buyers are looking for, but in manageable quantities. So if you look at these example pictures that are on the screen, we've got thick, um, colorful plastic. We've got that thinner, clear plastic. We've got that cloudy plastic. And then we have um, this very, very slick, thin, kind of brittle plastic that we get from those yogurt containers. And so that gives us all the different types of plastics that buyers are looking 
looking for, but because we collect for over 100,000 residences in the, the metro area, if we opened that up to take all the different types of plastics, we would have far more than we'd ever be able to sell. And so it's just a, ma a matter of making sure we manage quantity, supply, and demand. Um, fun little side note, there is a huge discrepancy between values of different types of plastic, and it's really interesting to me that milk jug plastic is usually the most valuable by a lot, by a significant amount. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that we do have drop off locations for recyclables. Everything that's flashing green is a cardboard drop off location. So we have those all around the Des Moines metro area to make it easy to manage that cardboard that you have coming to you in larger quantities than normal. But then anything that is red signifies a glass only drop off and anything that is yellow is a mixed recycling drop off. So I can um, share out a link at the end of this presentation if that's of interest that just has this interactive map so you can look at the hours and the address of each of these recycling drop off locations. Quick note on plastic bags. We do get a lot of questions about plastic bags because as we, most of us know, plastic bags are recyclable. We just don't want them in single stream recycling and this picture in the bottom left is a really good example of why that is. We um, have a lot of rotating gears at a recycling facility, and it makes it so easy for plastic bags to get wound up, tangled up, and then stop the machine from operating. So not only do you reduce the efficiency of the operation because you have to stop to get those pieces cut out, but the bags then are not able to be recycled in the unique way that they need to be. So if you think about all of the different locations like grocery stores, department stores, Walmarts, Targets that offer dedicated plastic plastic bag recycling, that is absolutely the best way to go. This picture on the right starts us to um, thinking about something called contamination. Contamination just means things that got mixed in with the recycling that weren't supposed to be there. And we would call plastic bags contamination because they're not supposed to be there. In this section, um, I had been standing in this little gap between cardboard and I think this side is mixed paper. And I was one of the last people on the recycling sorting line. There were about 18 of us working and this, this material that was coming to us at this point had already been through you know, 15, 16, 17 people. And I was noticing, my gosh, there's so much plastic and plastic film. So things like prime envelopes, um, the covers that go over like a big package of toilet paper or water bottle containers that kept coming through. And so I set a timer for five minutes and all I did was pull off that type of plastic. And this is the pile I was able to come up with. So it's about waist high and it's just five minutes worth of that plastic film that could have been recycled at one of those drop offs and instead is going to go you know, to the garbage because it's come to this facility that can't process or handle it. Thinking along those lines, I wanted to give you a little behind the scene look at what it's like for a sorter who's trying to sort out that contamination that's not supposed to be there. So this video is of me, I think in January, and I am on the PET line, which means I am trying to get anything that isn't a water bottle or a soda bottle pulled off the line and set on the correct path. And so as you watch, I think you'll get a sense of how quickly things move and how challenging it really is to remove contamination from the line. So at this point, I'm just getting started and I think I was feeling confident, but it doesn't take long before you become overwhelmed. I'm trying to slow them down, stop the material so I have time to grab it. They say on average, you have about 1.7 seconds to grab something before it's gone, which is easy if you're only trying to grab one thing. If there's a lot of things that you're trying to grab, 1.7 seconds feels like nothing at all. One other thing I think is great to point out with this video is this shows why we need multiple people working on the line because one person is gonna be incapable of getting everything so it's a relief to know that somebody is, you know, a couple stations down who can hopefully grab what I meant. OK, 
continuing on that thought about contamination, um, the kind of contamination we see very dramatically, um, and sometimes it seems really interesting. It seems like we have themed food days coming through the recycling lines. This is my friend Kelby standing here, and she's holding up three potatoes, and that was a potato day. All day long, we just saw whole potatoes, not rotten, just regular you know, look like they just come from the grocery store potatoes and they just kept coming down the line all day long. That was easy to pick off because they were loose. Other times we'll see contamination like full garbage bags that you can't see through. And so we typically ask our sorters not to open those bags, not only because of that 1.7 second rule, if they're taking time to open a bag, a lot of other recyclables are going to be passing them by. But the majority of the time what's inside that garbage bag is garbage. It's somebody who put the garbage bag into their recycling cart instead of the garbage cart, and then you have a lot of contamination that's gotten loose and is continuing down the line. It tends to be a lot of food stuff that we find in those bags, which is really difficult to get moved off the line as it continues through the process. Another thing we see an outrageous number of is diapers, dirty diapers that have been um, Velcroed shut the unfortunate thing is that Velcro does not stay attached. And so as that diaper is working its way down the line, it opens and whatever is inside is out. So that is something that we um, are definitely trying to tailor some of our education around so that people recognize, hey, diapers don't belong here. And it's a person on the other end who's dealing with that. Finally, all of those recyclables end up in that well-sorted container. They get um, run down something called a baler, which crushes them into that cube, and then they get loaded up onto the, the tractor trailers and transported to their next destination. And that is the cycle that our recycling goes through. So I always like to make sure we touch on a couple of sustainable living tips. A lot of times these are familiar tips that we've heard before, but there's a couple that I think sometimes are, are new. So obviously we love reduce, reuse, recycle. So if you're um, considering the packaging when choosing products, a really great example is if you're drinking a, a carbonated beverage and you can choose between a plastic bottle or a can, cans are much more efficiently recycled. So I would say choose the can every time. Um, reach for that reusable bag or choose paper bags. Avoid plastic grocery bags is is wonderful. And if you do use those plastic grocery bags, try to get them to that drop off at the grocery store the next time that you are there. Reuse, use your washable containers and dishes whenever possible. Um, know the guidelines of your local area and then keep up with them because they do sometimes change. Like I mentioned, it's driven by supply and demand. And so if there is a manufacturer who starts looking for a new material, we'll be able to expand what we accept. On the flip side, if somebody stops, you know, purchasing materials, we might have to restrict what we're accepting. So just keeping on top of that is great. And then my favorite is rethinking. How can you make it easier to make sustainable choices in the spaces in which you operate? And so my example for that one is I love to go out to eat and having restaurants open again has just been just so joyful for me. But I also, um, I just hate the feeling of, of having that meal ready to take home and having to put it in styrofoam or single use plastic because I know those are not recyclable items. Knowing that I have invested in a whole lot of collapsible um, takeout containers. They're, they're reusable, they're collapsible, they fit flat into my purse, they fit in my glove box, they fit in my backpack. And then anytime I go out to eat, I can just make sure I have those you know, in my in my bags, in my car, so that I can use that instead of a disposable single use take home container. What I also love about that is without fail, every time I whip out that collapsible container, somebody asks me about it or I'll see somebody, you know, pointing over at me and saying like, oh, that's a really good idea. So I think that's one of those things that spreads pretty quickly when people see you doing it. When it comes to corporate or business sustainability, that can be a lot more complicated just because, you know, instituting change is tough, it's time consuming. Um, there's a lot of things that maybe are above our level that we don't get to make decisions on. But some great tips that we personally use here at Metro is uh, we have groups called work teams at every site um, and we meet quarterly and we talk about not only environmental sustainability in general, but we make sure that we bring notes back with us about things we're noticing around our own workspaces that could be improved. Um, one example of that was even though we all work in the solid waste industry, there's a lot of confusion that goes along with recyclables. And so we talked about labeling our receptacles so that people know exactly what things go in there. So we have our recycling containers in the break room that have aluminum labeled with a picture of the, 
the cans and we have plastic labeled with a picture of a bottle. Um, and that's just helpful. We um, send out our little newsletter with tips for staff about things we can do that are environmentally um, of environmentally sustainable, but also relevant to the season. So like maybe in the summer, we'll talk about safe fireworks disposal. Um, we noticed that in some rooms, our automatic lights weren't functioning very well. And so we make sure to, to note those things and ask somebody to make changes to make sure those environmental sustainability factors are in place. And then we also are constantly asking for suggestions from employees of all levels, because there's gonna be things that you, know, you miss in your role that somebody else is gonna have close intimate knowledge of. So the more you can communicate as, as an agency, as a corporation, as a business, the better off you'll be when it comes to making those sustainable changes. And I do like to end with this just because I think it's something that we definitely should celebrate um, when it comes to recycling and when they compare states uh, and their, you know, their recycling scores, their recycling averages, we do really well. I was fifth in the nation when compared with other states. And I like to also note that we are at 62% of, you know, 100% recycling efficiency. So it lets us know that there is room for growth, but that we're doing a really good job. So I just think it's great to um, use that to motivate us. You know, we're doing a great job, but how can we do better? So at this point, you said you might have some questions already. And then um, if this does get, you know, shared with a larger audience and if questions arise there too, I am always happy to answer those. I'm very accessible and reachable and it's my favorite thing to talk about and answer recycling questions. Yeah, um, that was awesome. Um, the, the thing that comes to my mind first is the plastic bag. So a lot of times I like to put um, recyclables in plastic bags thinking that it might make it easier for transport where you know, putting them all together is better, but it, that doesn't seem to be the case. So I'll definitely be changing uh, that practice. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And see, when we know better, we do better, right? Yep, yep. exactly. Yep. And so, exactly. and I think that is usually the goal. People want to be helpful. You know, they want to make it easier for people on the other end. So, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And paper bags, if you do want to separate things, paper bags are, are the way to go. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, we do have some questions. Um, so the first one that I had um, was obviously Metro Waste Authority is sustained, like their goal is sustainability. Um, but thinking in terms of like the corporate office or um, the recycling centers themselves, like what features or are there qualities of those buildings that are, uh, they support like the green initiative or they're sustainable in, in that regard? Mm -hmm. Yes, so Metro Waste Authority is part of an EMS, which is an, an environmental management system. And so we're always having to do things to make sure we're keeping up with advancements to be as sustainable as possible. Um, and so like we are just completing a solar panel installation right now at our central office to you know, mitigate our greenhouse emissions. We constructed our new material recovery facility to be um, able to facilitate and, and hold that same type of solar panel. Um, we do things like have green charging stations for electric vehicles. Um, those are the types of things that we do to try to enhance our sustainability. But as with all corporations and agencies, I mean, there's room for improvement. And that's where those work teams come into play, looking for where those opportunities are. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I actually had a question. You kind of started to talk about it a little bit, but does Metro Waste Authority have any sustainable development goals for the next few years? Um, yes, we do have a lot of sustainable development goals. One of the big ones, though, is that greenhouse emission reduction. So looking at all of our different sites and how we are able to minimize those that the greenhouse gas emissions. So we do have solar panels at both landfills, but looking at ways to expand that. Um, and then we started to grow our electric vehicle fleet, but then looking for ways to continue expanding that program and then making our charging accessible, not only to us, but also to the community around those facilities. So like when we talk about putting electric charging stations in it, our downtown office, we talk a lot about like, well, how can we make sure that that's not just available for Metro employees, but also other people who have mm. those needs. Oh, very cool. I do have another question. Um, back to more of like the corporate sustainability side. Are there any metrics 
that companies could track to see how well they're doing on their sustainability efforts? Man, that's kind of a big question, right? Um, there's so many factors that affect your, your sustainability score overall. And I think it just kind of depends on what your agencies or corporations are doing um, and engaging in. So like if you're if you are involved in recycling, I think you could absolutely track what kinds of numbers you're having, um, your your weight of total recyclables or how often your recycling is collected and how full that recycling container is. Um, but it, I think it's hard to predict what metrics you could have access to without knowing what initiatives you're taking part in. Right. Mm -hmm. like most things do, sometimes you have to, to dig in a little, but I'd say most things do have a metric attached to them where you could track. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if there's still a lot of working from home with Walmart, but that has thrown off everybody's tracking just because your numbers are in constant flux, like your usage patterns are in flux. It's it's really hard to get good baselines right now. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, so given that there are so many nuances to what can be recycled and what the average person like the average person's education might be lacking in what is actually considered recyclable. So my question would be, what percentage of recyclables or what someone may think is recyclable um, that someone puts into the recycle bin actually makes it to the end stage of the recycle process and is like successfully reused, I guess? Yeah, um, I actually, so since we've only been operating for a few months at this point, I'm not sure what our numbers are in terms of how many of the actual recyclables make it to the recycled stage, but I know it is very high. That was part of the reason we ended up developing our own facility is to be able to have control over what happens to the recyclables once they get to us. Because before there was a private, and this company still exists, but it's a private company who process recycling and they have less oversight and regulation and restriction on what they do. What I can tell you that I know is when we look at what comes in, we tend to average, I think, about 12% contamination, which means items that shouldn't have been recycled that got put into the recycling cart. So I think our percentage of actual recyclables that goes into bales is very, very high, but I do know that we have a significant amount of contamination that has to be removed and sent to the garbage instead. Does that answer make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that was also part of the design of this facility is by combining optical scanners, large rotating augers, small rotating augers, augers, glass breakers, and then a staff of, you know, 13 to 18 people being able to get all, you know, nearly 100% of your recyclables grabbed is, is you know, not, not too lofty of a goal. Um, I have a second question. So in regard to, um, so say I am just starting out in the recycling game and I am struggling with the whole idea of like, what can I recycle or like, I really want to get better at recycling. Um, what are like the, the biggest barriers that you see um, that are pretty, pretty easy to remove basically to improve that recycling experience? Mm -hmm. um, I think having, the easiest protocols as possible, the easiest guidelines is is super useful. And that's why we do love that twist rule. It's not asking you to memorize which numbers are accepted and like asking you to look really close at every product. It's just saying, hey, can you twist the lid off? Would you eat it? Would you put it on you and it's okay? Go ahead and recycle it. Um, but then I also think putting out um, simple, easy to understand resources that are recycling guides. So picture-based resources is helpful. Um, I also think there is you kind of tread a fine line though too because sometimes people feel bad or overwhelmed when they can't recycle the thing they've been recycling you know they learn like oh geez what's the point like i've been recycling that thing for the last 10 years and now i learn i can't what's the point um so it's not making people feel bad about the we call it wish cycling you know the wishful recycling that you've done not to guilt people for it but just to say like hey moving forward Here's this easy set of, of guidelines and rules. Um, things like this, though, are really helpful when groups ask somebody to come in and talk about it and then can disseminate that information. That's huge in helping people to know, like, this is, oh, this is how you do it. Okay. And like you mentioned, you put some stuff in some in garbage bags to help out. Like, that's great that you did that. It's nothing to feel bad about, but just now you know, paper bags <laughs> might be better. Just 
or just save your time and you don't need to worry about doing that. Right. But it's nothing to feel bad about. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> like, hey, thanks for doing that. But can you not in the future? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> right. Yeah, lots of good tips. Yeah. Also, I think talking really? to kids, kids is, are a huge gateway to changing societal norms. You know, kids love to go home and be like, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, like that's wrong. And so trying to tap into educating the youth is also a really big factor, which is why we have that huge um, education center at that recycling facility. And, you know, that's why they have like roles like mine, you know, taking a classroom teacher and saying, hey, let's put you here so that we can help educate better. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Um, is, is there like one environmental regulation that you would like to see passed that maybe that maybe doesn't currently exist at like a local or like to like a federal level? Any like um, gray areas that aren't covered or regulation yet? I think most of the things that jump to my mind are not so much connected to the work on this end, the waste management side, but more on the production end. Um, we talk about that uh, recycling symbol. We call it chasing arrows instead of recycling symbol because it is used often, as I would argue, a manipulation tool to make people feel like they're making an environmental choice when they purchase an item. But really that symbol can mean a whole lot of different things. Um, if there's like a circle on the back of it and then there, like there's a circle with the little chasing arrows over it, that just means that some component of that item was made from something that was recycled, it has nothing to do about its next stage. And so I think I would love to see a streamlined system and, and communication tool that we use that's, that helps people understand what the next stage for that product is and prevents corporations sometimes from misusing a symbol to manipulate people into thinking they're making environmentally friendly choices when they might not be. Um, and I actually have been seeing some change in that already. I don't know if you've noticed um, places where there maybe used to be just that chasing arrow sign. Now there's a box that'll say like paper, and then the little recycling logo. So that tells you exactly what the material is and then what to do with it. But even those sometimes bother me, like Amazon envelopes will say recycle this or recyclable, but it totally depends on what your local regulations are. And so I would just like to see more oversight in how people frame their product, I suppose. Yeah, very interesting. Those are all the questions that I had, uh, Gina or Cody, any other questions? Um, not a question, but I would be interested in getting that link you mentioned of the map of the drop off centers. That would be great. Yep, I will absolutely send that. Would you like me to send an email? Would I put it in the chat? What's the easiest? Yeah, maybe email and then we could send it out with um, the recording of this presentation. Awesome. I also have a really cool thing I just finished building that is an interactive tour of that recycling facility, including you can click on all the bales and learn about commodity values and like how those things are determined. Um, and it's it's pretty cool. So I could send that to in case anybody would have interest in seeing a little deeper dive into each of those pieces of equipment and how that all works. Yeah, that'd be cool. Thanks. Yeah, I really learned a lot from this. It was very interesting. Great. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Sir, really appreciate your time and um, the valuable insights that you've provided. I've, I've learned a lot in just the past, what, 40-ish minutes that we've been talking. So thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I do encourage you to reach out with any questions. You are you know, free to share my contact information as well if people do have follow-ups. We're we're here to, to be part of this with you all, so. Awesome. Sounds great. All right. Well, I will follow up with an email shortly, but again, thanks for the opportunity and the time. Yes, right. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.